There we go. 6 a.m. in Hawaii. We're six hours distant. All right. Well, it's 12 o'clock noon. We have 30 plus participants. Let me introduce myself. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and uh, I host the I coordinate the Forest Connect program. I have a lot of help and there's a lot of good colleagues that I work with. And part of the Forest Connect program is a monthly webinar series, since that's what you all are seeing here today. And I'd like to welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. I want to orient you to some aspects of this uh, software system. And the, so you've all figured out I think you've all figured out or you've seen how you can type questions in. And I will try and monitor the chat pod as I'm presenting, but even though they're side by side on my screen, it's sometimes a challenge to uh, to know that one thing's happening in one spot versus another. So, But the good news is I'll be able to scroll backwards at the end, and if I've missed any questions, we'll capture them at that time. And you can also just repost them. Perhaps also of interest, if you go to the upper left-hand corner and you have the file menu, and this only works for this live presentation, so we're, I'm recording this, and the people that will watch this on YouTube uh, won't have this option, but if you go to the file menu and select either save or save as the document, you can save um, a PDF version, make sure you select PDF, not UCF, a PDF version of this PowerPoint presentation. And then that way, if you have, you know, any reason to go back and look at any content, you'll have access to it. And you won't have to sit through an hour long presentation. So, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, happy to be able to give this presentation. This was, part of a series of presentations that were given during the just preceding the winter greenup conference near Albany, New York back in January. I've modified this some because I have a bit more time and I've had a bit more time to think about it. And there was a series of presentations and panel discussions dealing with silvopasture. And so Brett Chedzoy and I offered two within this topic of sustainable growing quality timber and forage. Last month's webinar, which actually just happened two weeks ago, was uh, putting trees into the pasture, and then I'm talking about putting pasture into the forest. So it's a slightly, you know, kind of two different spins on it. And the um, the the notion of silvo pasture is the integration of both forest science, forage science, and animal science. And so it's that that intersection. If we look at the Venn diagram on the right, we can see that intersection is, is that region that we'll know and think about as silvo pasture. And it's been, been variously defined, but basically it's the process of sustainably uh, growing uh, timber, forage, and livestock. And during silvo pasture, you're going to manage four different aspects of your, your of your land base or your system. These include tree density, tree species, forage species, and animal behaviors. We're going to be looking today just really at tree density and tree species, and one aspect of that is managing sunlight. Uh, there's been uh, uh, at least three other webinars dealing with silvo pasture, and I would encourage you to go to the YouTube site. Uh, the Forest Connect YouTube site and look at those other uh, webinars, or you can go to forestconnect.info and in the publications we have um, a, a large number of written materials dealing with silvo pasture. So I'll give you kind of the punchline here at the beginning so you can get an idea of where we're going. This is a little bit different than the outline that we'll cover, but the summary and, and what I, I want to build to is kind of a five-step process if you're wanting to move pasture into the woods. And, and with all uh, private ownership projects, you need to start with whatever the owner's objectives are. And those uh, would ostensibly be to develop forage so that you can graze livestock, 
uh, but there may be other uh, and grow timber as well and do all sustainably of course but there may be other objectives that should be incorporated into that very explicitly so that you don't lose track of them and don't lose um, you know, don't kind of get going down the wrong um, wrong alleyway. This picture is from our woods where I'm trying to develop uh, silvo pasture, and one of the objectives I didn't consider that uh, was of interest um, to my wife and daughters was some of the aesthetics of dealing with the debris, and we'll talk a little bit more about debris management. Second is you'll want to evaluate sites. Uh, you may have multiple sites that you're considering, and so you want to prioritize those locations. There are going to be a number of different conditions of the forest that you'll want to consider, and uh, we'll look at some of each of those. You'll have to develop a harvesting plan, and then you'll also have to develop some kind of a plan to establish and develop, uh, grow the forages. So those are all, um, this is kind of a summary, and we'll conclude with that as well, but I just want to give you a sense of where we're headed with this. So as I mentioned, when we're developing pasture into the woods, uh, really what we're doing is we're managing some of And that's what, when, we, when you talk to a forester, when you think about what happens in a forest and how you, get, how you make changes in a forest, you make changes largely because you're reallocating the surface, the vegetative surface that receives some of them. So if you go into an unmanaged forest, all of the sunlight or the majority of the sunlight is captured uh, 60 to 100 feet above ground in the, in the forest canopy. And so by manipulating the forest canopy, we're changing the availability of light and we're increasing or decreasing to various extents the shade that's available for livestock, uh, the potential for future harvests from that forest, uh, the way in which we're going to regenerate the forest, the opportunities that we have to establish different forage species, and then the amount of light will also give advantages or disadvantages to some forage species over other forage species. So with that, that kind of setting the stage, I want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, we'll go through a, some background and context, and then we'll look at thinning methods to increase the amount of solar radiation or sunlight at the ground level. That's where the forage is going to be. There are some general comments that we can make about how we select trees, and then finally some comments about working with foresters. So this, these three parts, the thinning methods, the tree selection, and the working with foresters are the basis for how you're going to go about establishing um, forage, establishing pasture in the forest. There's a lot more details. These are going to be largely general principles. Uh, as we'll see, the, the specifics of whatever you're working with, we have people from all across the country, from Maine to Hawaii, and uh, the, the details of the tree species, the details of the soil conditions, uh, the local climate, uh, the availability of different forages will all dictate the, the prescription that you would need to establish that pasture. And so we'll be looking at some of the concepts and some of the principles. So uh, first of these is to approach all of your endeavors in solo pasture and maybe in a lot of what you do, uh, thinking about the scale of operation. And when we do uh, day workshops, uh, Brett Chedzoy and Joe Arfiche and I have been around the Northeast and done a series of day workshops on silvo pasture. And one of the parting messages we have, uh, one of the parting messages that we have when we offer those workshops is to plan for a small train wreck. If you're starting something and you don't have much experience with it, and there's a lot of experience that is yet to be gained in the Northeast, start with a uh, small train wreck. So don't, you know, maybe don't go out and plan on 100 acres or 200 acres, but plan on two acres or 10 acres or 20 acres. If you're planning on a much larger scale, plan for, uh, make sure that you've been particularly attentive to the details. So you want to uh, try and minimize the size of the train wreck. Um, everybody's going to make mistakes and everybody's going to learn as they go along. And so it's, it's easier to recover from that when they're, they're small missteps rather than large missteps. 
A second point, kind of a caveat that I'd like to offer is to be prepared to, uh, I'll say, chew what you bite off. And we can look at this from two different perspectives. This is, uh, again, my woods, and I'm at a very small scale of, um, and I, I think technically I qualify as silver pasture, although some days I wonder. But the, the point here, on one hand, is that if you have livestock, you need to have something for them to eat. And as you look at my woods, you can see there's basically nothing for my lambs to eat. So I spent all of last summer feeding my lambs, which isn't really forage management, is it? It's, you know, not when you go and buy hay from your neighbors. The other side of the coin is when you are aggressively trying to develop pasture, uh, make sure that you have an adequate livestock base as that pasture develops you need to be able to manage that. And, um, and so you need to find that, that balancing point between the amount of livestock that you have and the amount of pasture that you have. And then the third um, uh, point of encouragement that I'll offer, uh, Brett Chedzoy uh, developed and we've been using a civil pasture forest site assessment form. And if you go to the publications page, at forestconnect.info, there is a uh, about a three-page um, kind of self-evaluation site assessment tool that you can use that looks at all of the attributes that you see on the screen. This is we're not going to talk about that uh, today at all, but that's an important process to go through when you're considering one part of your woodlot or a different part of your woodlot as a place to establish. Uh, pasture in the woods, so don't just well just proceed with that as a as a with all due caution and use that. It's, I think it's a it's quite a useful tool to help you think through some of the different options that you might have. Okay, so the first part that we want to talk about is thinning methods. Uh, so this is uh, and again this is everything that we're going to talk about today. Everything I'm going to be talking about really deals with how we're managing sunlight and where that sunlight is being utilized. Uh, so we want to start by looking at the forest. We want to then think about some of the effects of thinning, and then we're going to talk basically bluntly about how to kill trees. So when we look at the forest, the forest uh, visually is described by what we think about as stand structure and composition. And the stand is is a forestry jargon for a management unit. It would be equivalent to a farmer's field. So we would have a pumpkin field or a pasture or a soybean field. Uh, similarly, you would have a stand in a forest where you have basically homogeneity of the vegetation. And because of the homogeneity of the vegetation, you have homogeneity of management activities. Um, so stand structure is what it physically looks like. It's the uh, the sizes of the trees, the ages of the trees, the variation in size and age, and then composition is the mixture of the species. And so together, this the sizes of the trees and mixture of species are what make uh, each stand and each property unique. And so they give us different opportunities, they give us different challenges. Uh, particular stands will have different values per acre. They'll require or have access to different markets. They will uh, necessitate a different prescription to manipulate it and to achieve a certain desired outcome. The stand structure and composition may also reflect differences in soil fertility, and they'll provide different opportunities for livestock. So let's look at just, uh, I think you probably get the picture, so to speak, but let's look at a few pictures just to illustrate the variations that we might be considering or that we might run into when we have different stand structures and different stand compositions. And all of these might occur on the same property, or none of them. I mean, there, you may have different stand structures and compositions on your properties. Oh, wow, well, I did have pictures there and they didn't show up. so. Um, we'll just keep going. Those, uh, the, so the stand structures would range from anything from um, a young hardwood plantation, to a pine plantation, to a mature mixed forest, to a, um, to an exploited forest. And so 
uh, imagine stands that have uh, all hardwoods, all conifers, mixtures of hardwoods, mixtures of um, of uh, different age classes, maybe it's young hardwoods, maybe it's mature conifers. So you can just think about those different kinds of forests that you've been in that you have on your property or that you, uh, for foresters that you work with. And so all of those provide different kinds of, of characteristics. And one of the characteristics that those different stand structures um, influence is the quantity of light. And so the quantity of light or light quantity is the intensity of light. And so when you go out on a hot summer afternoon and it's there's no clouds in the sky, the intensity of that light is, is the quantity. This is one of the most important um, variables in nature. It's a major determinant, if not the major determinant, of growth and yield in plants. And obviously plants photosynthesize. That's uh, PHS's shorthand for photosynthesis. Uh, plants photosynthesize in general quite well when they're in full sunlight. Photosynthesis becomes limited, and you can recognize there's going to be a lot of variation depending on trees, plant species, but photosynthesis is typically limited at about a quarter to a third of full sunlight. Now, knowing that that's uh, where limitations happen, the understory in a pine plantation or a pine stand may be 10 to 15 percent of full sunlight. So this would be in an unmanaged pine forest. And then in an unmanaged hardwood forest, the, uh, the, the quantity of light at the ground level is going to be less than 5% of full sunlight. So in the case of both, uh, both of these understories, they are below that point at which photosynthesis is limited. So we have to be able to manipulate light and, and increase the availability of sunlight at the ground layer in order to uh, manage, develop and manage forages. So light quantity is one uh, attribute. The other attribute of light is called light quality. And light quality refers to the wavelength of light. And we have PAR, which is photosynthetically active radiation, is in the uh, 400 to 700 nanometer range. And it, and it peaks at about 650 in terms of light quality for photosynthesis. Uh, there's another wavelength of light that plants perceive that's known as the far red wavelength, uh, and that's something above 700 nanometers. As light passes, think about light passing vertically through a forest canopy. And so if we have, this is our forest canopy, and we have, uh, we have upper canopy, and then we have mid canopy, and we have lower canopy. These are all vegetative filters. Uh, by the, by the foliage that's absorbing, preferentially absorbing the photosynthetically active um, wavelengths of light in that 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, uh, plants uh, do not preferentially absorb and in fact don't generally find much utility in the far red wavelengths. So as they absorb the red wavelengths, they're disproportionately increasing the amount of far red wavelengths. And so that changes the ratio in plants detect this ratio, and when you reduce the ratio of red to far red light, you tend to reduce the germination of seeds. You increase the amount of etiolation, which is the long spindly stems. You've seen that plants kind of growing in the dark. And then you have reduced leaf area, so the, the, the biomass that's produced is going to be, is going to be uh, reduced. Uh, and the ratio can range from a, a a red to far red ratio might be something like 1.3 in the upper canopy of a closed forest, and then in the in the ground layer, the herbaceous layer of the closed forest, it might be something on the order of 0 0.2. So those are the, and I don't even know really what numbers are used to calculate those ratios, but it gives you a sense that there's a fourfold difference uh, in this ratio of red to far red as you move from the upper canopy to the lower canopy. So. Again, if we're trying to remembering back our definition of silvopasture where we're sustainably managing timber, livestock, and forage, if we're going to manage for that forage and we know that plants respond to the red to far red ratios, we need to be reallocating light. 
uh, and, and, and in, in reallocating that light, we can think about the different layers, and we have upper and lower canopy positions. And we, when we manipulate the forest, we'll need to manipulate both the upper canopy as well as the lower canopy. So let's think about specifically about canopy in the terms of crown costs. And this is an illustration um, from um, Beattie's book on working with your woodland. And it's showing a mixed hardwood conifer forest that might be something that we would see in the Northeast. And on this lower panel, you see the letters C, S, D, and I, uh, which stand for the D is the dominant, C are the co-dominants, I are the intermediates, and S is suppressed. Um, and so if, we, if we're trying to manage for timber, we would typically be trying to manage for those upper crown class trees. These are trees that are best suited to the site, especially if this is an even-aged forest where uh, all of the trees are essentially the same age, but they vary in their growth rates. These bigger trees are best, have proven themselves best able to capture sunlight. Uh, in contrast, we would be wanting to disfavor or select against some of the lower crown class trees. Uh, these are trees that are going to be intercepting sunlight but are not going to be offering much in the way of either timber production and certainly nothing in the way of forage production. So when we think about allocating sunlight, we're going to be opening up the forest canopy and we'll be retaining timber trees. Uh, this picture illustrates the uh, a forest that has been manipulated to retain the timber trees. And then we're either going to allocate sunlight to firewood trees, some combination of firewood trees or forage. And uh, when, we, when we look at what this would be in just using some stark contrasts, we can think about a, a forest where all of the sunlight, 100% of the sunlight is allocated to timber. And, you know, give me, you know, some of you are looking at this picture of a, of a red pine plantation and wondering how I got timber from that. But just, you know, humor me, this is a, this is a case where we're, there's no understory development and um, there's not much in the way of, of low value utilization. We could have a situation where, and this would be maybe more typical for a lot of traditional uh, forests, private land forests, where you have some combination uh, of timber production and, and firewood production. Uh, and that those don't get hung up on the percentages. Uh, the point is that we have 100% of the sunlight that we're going to allocate, in this case, between timber and firewood. And then finally, we would have some allocation between timber, firewood, and forages. So we're, we're manipulating the structure of the stand. We're manipulating the, uh, the composition of the stand. And by doing that, we're providing sunlight to, in different amounts, to different availabilities of forage, firewood, and timber. So one of the effect, effects of thinning is that we can, uh, if we do it correctly, and then we follow up with, so when, you, when we add sunlight to the forest floor, something is going to respond to that sunlight. And it may be that we're able to uh, develop a desirable understory, so an understory that has uh, palatable and nutritious forages. It's also possible, if we're not paying attention, that we can develop an undesirable understory. Uh, and this is going to be most likely the case if we're, uh, this is a high-graded stand where the, where the forest was exploitively harvested, the biggest and best trees were removed, and there was already established an undesirable understory of uh, in this case, American beech, and there are many other species that you can, can um, deal with. Uh, in fact, later this afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's a, a webinar um, by, I've, I've forgotten now, but there's a webinar on how to manage undesirable grasses. So there's a lot of different species that are going to respond when you add sunlight. Some, the point is something will respond, and as a manager, you want to try and guide those species that respond so that you're able to um, so that you're able to uh, take advantage of them. Another effect of thinning is that you're going to create some amount of debris. And 
the, the challenge with debris is that depending upon the harvesting system that you're working with, you may have greater or lesser abilities to utilize it. This is a, a research area at one of at the Cornell University Arnott Forest where Brett Chedzoy and I and Joshua Pizze are doing some work on forage trials and in the process of thinning it we were uh, we were um, we created an awful lot of debris, and so we were having to, it was a small enough area that it was not a commercial harvest, and so we were uh, personally needing to find ways to deal with this. And this is the same kind of situation that I have in my woods. I'm, I'm shooting for a very small train wreck, and so um, I'm, I don't have enough for commercial operation, but I do have enough to create a lot of debris that, that can be unsightly if it's not managed correctly. Um, so this is kind of a negative uh, or, or a challenge, I'm going to call it a negative, it's a challenge and there are some harvesting systems that we'll see in just a minute that have a way to take, it, to take care of this. One of the advantages though is that you're reducing the competition on the desirable trees. Uh, if you leave behind desirable trees, you're reducing competition on those trees and because of that, those trees will grow more quickly. And this is a graphic uh, from some work by Bill Leak and colleagues where they were looking at the production of timber in the northern hardwoods area. And they were comparing, and this is a computer simulation, and this is looking at cumulative volume following uh, various thinnings. But we have the kind of the dark gray line. The lower line is the unthinned stand. And at any given age, the thinned stand has a higher total volume than the unthinned. So thinning is going to increase the production of timber if it's done correctly. Uh, the, the actual numbers will vary depending upon the species and depending upon the soil and site conditions. But through judicious thinning, you're going to increase the volume and increase the value of timber that you have available. Uh, that thinning process, the effect of thinning is also going to change the opportunities for different types of forages to establish. And, and uh, I don't have the, the details, and uh, this would be a, a presentation unto itself, to look at the different types of forage species that would become established under different thinning regimes. There's been uh, some research done on this already. Uh, Joe Orofice with uh, the University of New Hampshire and Paul Smith's college is doing additional research on this in New York. Uh, Brett and Joshua and I are also doing some research. So there's research that is developing. Uh, the folks with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and soil and water conservation districts have a lot of personal experience and research through their plant material centers. So there's a developing body of information that can guide uh, the species that would be used. Uh, the, the, the noteworthy point to make here is that grasses and other broadleaf forages uh, can survive and can do well and can maintain good quality in uh, partial sun or partial shade. So there's a number of those uh, species that have great potential for utility in civil pasture systems in the Northeast. When we're uh, when we're harvesting for silvopasture establishment, there are going to be some particular harvesting targets that are important to think about, uh, and that maybe are a little bit more, a little bit different than a, a standard harvesting system. If you're just thinning your woods for timber production or trying to cut some firewood, so again, we're we're focusing in on controlling uh, the amount of sunlight that's available at the ground layer. So we will need to we will need to uh, not only cut those trees that have some potentially some immediate utilitarian value, these are some firewood or, or low grade saw log trees that were marked. This is part of our civil pasture forage trial area at the Arnott Forest. Uh, but you're also going to have to manage some of the smaller trees. So some of the trees of this size, of this size, that don't have any immediate value, um, but that that yet create shade, and because of creating shade, are going to influence the, the nature and quality of the forages. Because uh, trees are going to develop a leaf area uh, uh, prior to developing wood, 
the rate at which the shade returns to the forest. So as you cut some of those trees, the trees that are retained, the crowns will grow bigger. They're going to cast more shade. That shade is going to accumulate at a faster rate probably than it will accumulate wood. So you'll need to, when you're developing a harvesting plan and you're going to uh, be advantaged to work with a forester and think specifically not just about the current harvest, but what's going to be necessary for harvests uh, five years or 10 years or 15 years down the road. So you want to maintain, we'll talk a little bit about some of those um, strategies in just a minute. Retain the highest value trees. Uh, that doesn't mean you wouldn't necessarily cut some of the high value trees, but by and large you want to focus uh, retention of high value trees. Uh, removing the lower value trees. Uh, spacing is important because you're going to be regulating the distribution of sunlight and to the extent possible you want to have a relatively uniform distribution of sun and shade. Uh, as, as, the, as the sun moves across the sky over the course of the day, there's going to be variously uh, portions that are variously shaded or illuminated. And if you have a regular pattern of tree crowns, then you'll have a more regular pattern of sunlight and shade um, patches on the ground. We'll talk and I'll show you an illustration in just a minute about border trees for fencing. And then we've already mentioned debris management. And uh, you think very uh, deliberately about how you're going to manage the debris because if you, uh, if you just leave it behind, it becomes an encumbrance to establish forages and it may be a barrier to some of your livestock, uh, for the livestock to access uh, parts of your silvo pasture. So some of the ways that we actually kill trees, these are uh, some either non-utilization methods. You can see the use of herbicides. So we have a basal bark treatment, we have a stem injection process, and we have some mechanical treatments down here. Here's a, a fecon mower. This is uh, girdling, and this is uh, manual felling for uh, probably for firewood. So these are, are either non-commercial or very low commercial opportunities. Uh, some of this may be needed depending on the structure that you have. If you have a low structure where you have small trees, uh, you can you can do a great job in manipulating the overstory, but you can have a, a sub canopy that is also a full closed canopy that also needs to be manipulated. And then there are different ways to uh, harvest where you're going to utilize the product. And this is this is a nice option if you have this option available. It may be that you can uh, hire a logging crew, work with a forester to bring in a logging crew and do some kind of an integrated harvest where they're bringing out low value wood for pulpwood or firewood as well as some saw timber. Uh, it may be that you're going to do the harvesting yourself. You have the skill and the equipment to safely harvest trees and then either sell or utilize those trees. And it may be that you do some also some combination of both where you, uh, you're going to harvest some of the bigger trees and in the process of harvesting them you'll provide uh, treatments of various sorts. This was a, a basal or a, I'm sorry, a cut stump treatment of American beech stems that resulted in uh, dead uh, beech saplings. So there's there's a lot of these integrations. So what I want to do now is to show a, a slide series. These were uh, pictures that were posted by Jeff Jordan, who's a forester in Massachusetts, who's working with Ross Hackerson in Huntington, Mass, to develop uh, silvo pasture. And I've given, um, I don't have all of the details on the harvest. I've provided Jeff's email um, and uh, also the, the link. Jeff had posted these it's on the Ming site, and Jeff said I could share these. And the point is just to illustrate some, some commercial scale uh, operability uh, for developing silver pasture. And there are other foresters that are doing this in New York, uh, and, and I don't certainly know everybody that's doing this, but I've heard of. Uh, Debbie Boyce with Northwoods Forest Consulting up in the, the J New York area who's doing some work with this. Rich McDermott, who's a DEC forester, is working with Karina Aldrich of NRCS to uh, mark and harvest, ultimately harvest areas to develop silvo pasture. And then in Pennsylvania, John Hopkins and, and uh, Roy Brubaker are doing this. Um, and those of you that have seen Brett Chedsoy's uh, which, you know, the bread is also doing a lot of also pasture establishment and Joe Horthy Chase. So 
there are several people around. This is a, one illustration. So this is the pre-harvest forest, and you look at this and you think, um, wow, there's not a lot of value there. There's an awful lot of stems per acre. Uh, what's it going to take in order to get this work done and not have to pay out of pocket to get that work done? I don't know if, if Jeff's participating, but he can he can certainly um, uh, chime in with additional points of, of clarification. So they were able to uh, find a, a local logger that had a mechanized operation and equipment. Those The value of those trees are so low, it wouldn't make sense and be feasible to try and do this as a hand operation, manual operation. And uh, by by having this mechanization, they were able to more fully utilize the wood that was there. So they brought in the machine, started cutting trees, and uh, because they were doing um, uh, because of the harvesting method, they left behind a relatively clean site. So this is an area that's that's been harvested. Uh, you can see that the debris management here is, in, I'd say, is in very good shape. There's some debris that's left behind. Uh, depending upon the forages that will be established, they may need to do some type of scarification, but they've managed sunlight. They have a, a nice distribution of forest canopy left behind, and then uh, they'll be developing forages in response to that. Okay, so uh, we can move on now to the next section, the second section on tree selection. And here we're going to be asking the question, and, and this is again developing some general principles about which trees we're going to cut, how much we should cut, um, and how we go about killing or cutting those trees. And we've we've talked about some of the the harvesting methods, the commercial and non-commercial methods to kill or cut. So we'll want to start by thinking about what we retain. And when, we, when we're working in the woods and we're talking about harvesting, I think it's better to focus on what you leave behind more so than what you cut. Certainly you have to be attentive, uh, attentive to um, what you take out, if it's commercial, it needs to be of sufficient volume and value to make it worthwhile or the logger doesn't show up. Um, but what we're really trying to do is grow trees and grow forage, and so that is, um, and then we're focusing on what we're keep leaving behind. So Adam wants to know if I can expand on the uh, debris management options. Um, hmm. So I think ideally what you will have is the uh, is the option if you if you have a so you have either commercial or non-commercial kind of non-commercial might be a do-it-yourself and if you're in the do-it-yourself category then you you have the uh, the challenge of having potentially an awful lot of debris if you're cutting low value trees you know, even if you're removing them for firewood or maybe you have a portable mill and you're doing some sawing of boards there's still much of the tree that is unusable. And so you have to find a way to aggregate that so that that's, uh, if there's very much of it, you have to aggregate it. You can see in the picture, this is from uh, Brett Chedzoy's farm where, where it's a black locust and black walnut plantation. And Brett had cut some of the black locust for fence post. And you can see that there's some scattered debris around. Uh, much of the debris was taken out for firewood, well, primarily taken out for, for fence posts, then taken out for firewood, and there's a small enough volume that it's more or less scattered about. In in my woods, I have a lot of low-value pine, and so I create that the, the doesn't warrant coming out for anything, and so I end up creating piles. If you have a commercial harvest and, and you have uh, the logger in there with equipment, you may be able to uh, to negotiate a deal. If it's not a whole tree harvest, which would get rid of a lot of that uh, upper branch wood, then you may be able to work a deal with the logger to utilize as much as possible and use some of their machinery to uh, to bunch up uh, piles of debris. So it depends on, um, you know, you've got the options of either dispersed or aggregated. And uh, hopefully there are some others who are participating that, uh, that, can, that can add some thoughts to that as well. 
So the species that we retain, we want to make sure first and foremost that these are species that are adapted to the site. We're going to be uh, developing um, these trees over time, and so we're making long, these are long-term investments, and if the site conditions don't satisfy the demands of the species, then it's just going to be uh, years and decades of frustration. Hopefully the trees that are adapted to the site have some um, acceptable future value. Uh, the, the value, the future value of the trees is part of the sustainability of the timber crop or the wood products crop, as the case may be. You could imagine a sugar bush. Uh, we're not really thinking about timber production. Uh, but there's some future value in those trees. And that the trees that are left behind are compatible with pasture management. And there are, uh, most trees are going to be compatible with pasture management. Some like black locust, are um, are especially compatible because of the light penetration through the canopy. Uh, you can um, you can maintain uh, probably maintain a slightly higher stocking of trees and still have a well developed forage base. And based on research out of the University of Missouri at the Agroforestry uh, Research Center there, uh, where they were looking in oak stands, they're recommending roughly a 50% crown closure. So you have 50% sunlight, 50% crown, um, and uh, distribute those as uniformly as possible. Um, how much you should take out, either by killing it or cutting it, and then you might use herbicides or girdling or harvesting of various kinds. Uh, some kind of obvious statements, if you will, is that you want to remove enough so that you can increase the sunlight to favor the forage species that you want. Um, there's not a strong research base on this in the Northeast. Uh, the best recommendations come out of oak uh, research in the lower Midwest out of Missouri, uh, where they're looking at a 50% canopy closure. Uh, you, you could also consider that what you're really trying to do is, to, is a regeneration cut. So you're, you're manipulating a closed canopy forest to a regeneration cut. So for the foresters, you might be thinking something on the lines of a shelter wood or seed tree. Those of seed tree would be a very heavy cut, and there are some downsides to that because you may not be leaving behind enough volume for uh, future harvests. Um, and you need to be cutting enough so that you can attract a contractor, uh, a logger, to come in and do the work for you. There's a general rule of thumb that you don't want to remove more than about a third of the basal area. But that rule of thumb could be um, expanded upon. You might be able to remove more than a third of the basal area if you have a good history of management. So if the, the trees that are growing are thrifty and uh, uh, will be well positioned to respond to thinning, then you can be more, perhaps be a little bit more aggressive. So I mentioned earlier uh, retaining some living fence trees. This is a project that Brett and I worked on at the Arnott Forest. And uh, it's just using, it was an idea that we got from a, from a fence distributor in Keene, New Hampshire, uh, where he was managing uh, livestock. And without much soil, it's difficult to get fence posts into the ground. And then even if you can get fence posts in the ground, that's an expensive option. So we started doing some experimenting and we have a uh, project where we're going to be putting up uh, these living fence uh, living fence post fences and uh, the pricing is is quite favorable we did some early estimates this is uh, for materials and labor less than a dollar a foot a linear foot running foot for all strands some of the selection criteria to pick the winners and the losers, and these are, of course, going to be um, uh, filtered through the owner's objectives, but you will want to remove high-risk trees. These are trees that uh, particularly might have a lifespan that's less than the harvest interval. And so the do-it-yourselfers who are out in the woods every year and can pick up trees as they start to decline uh, can have a fairly a short harvest interval if it's a commercial operation and you might not have a logging crew back in for 10 or 15 years. You need to have a, 
uh, a better crystal ball to predict which trees are going to die. So you want to you want to capture that value in those trees before the tree dies. Um, you want to remove undesired stems, and you might define undesired stems as trees that have a defect in their crown, so it's a weak crown or a poorly formed crown. It might be an undesirable species, or it might be a, a tree that has uh, stem defects, that, particularly stem defects that make it prone to uh, collapse or falling or failure. You'll have to cut some potentially acceptable stems that crowd high value stems. So you may have a cluster of oak trees or a cluster of sugar maple, trees of high value, all of them can't stay around, so you make choices that result in favoring some and disfavoring others. Be cautious not to overcut the stand. Uh, overcutting can result in some uh, some some post thinning shock and some uh, degrade in the value of the trees that you left behind as high value trees. And then, of course, be uh, alert to and avoid at all costs high grading where you cut the biggest and best trees and leave behind the poor quality stems. One of the one of the uh, characteristics of trees to favor is to look at the crown class of the trees. And I've separated out here the upper crown class, the dominance and co-dominance, and this is uh, from Ralph Nyland's textbook on silviculture. Um, same concept as we've talked about uh, before with Susan Beatty's book, but these upper uh, dominant and co-dominant trees when compared to the intermediates and suppressed, those upper canopy trees have a three to eight fold uh, greater capacity to respond to sunlight and to grow than the lower crown class trees do. So there, there's great advantage to leaving those upper crown class trees. One way to select trees for uh, retention is to use a process known as crop tree management. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not really advocating this. It's a, it's a great technique for landowners who are interested in growing uh, particular trees for timber or for wildlife or aesthetics. And it's a tree-centric process where you pick a tree and then you open up portions of the canopy so that it's free to grow. And you would typically think about opening up uh, one, two, three, or four faces or four sides, making those uh, sides that are free to grow. Uh, the challenge with crop tree management is that it, it doesn't, it's not an explicit control of stand structure. And stand structure is what's going to determine how much sunlight comes in. And so with the tree-centric approach, it's focused on the tree, and that tree gets sunlight. But we're interested in more than just the tree. We're also interested in sunlight at the ground layer. So you may be familiar with this from other kinds of woodlot management discussions, but it's probably not the best way to go in terms of developing a silvo pasture. A better way to go, well, no, so here's a, um, here's a research plot that I put in several years ago. I'm looking at a four-sided crop tree release. It's a very intense cutting. It created a lot of sunlight on the forest floor. There was a lot of understory development. In this case, it was all raspberry. And it re-illustrates the point of you know, being ready to chew what you bite off. And if you did uh, 10 or 15 or 30 acres of four-sided release, you're going you're gonna to end up with a woodlot that has a high uh, potential for understory development. And, and you'll want to try and control what type of understory actually develops there. So again, crop tree management is probably not the way to go. A better way to approach this is a technique known as area-wide thinning or basal area thinning. It's more complicated to approach. This is the kind of technique that foresters learn in school. It's not tree-centric. It's rather uh, centered around uh, manipulating stand structure. And because we're controlling stand structure, which is the number and sizes of trees, we're going to be better able to control the growing condition for forages. And what it works on is where it works from is a series of numeric targets. So you're trying to shift the growth to the best trees and allow sunlight to go to other plants. Uh, so to illustrate this, and this is an illustration I gave a webinar a few months ago about thinning for timber production. So this first graphic 
uses what's called a stocking chart. And this stocking, stocking chart is a graph that has the number of trees per acre and then the basal area per acre. This is a stocking chart that is uh, specific to upland hardwoods and other forest types would have different, slightly different shapes and orientations, but the principles would remain the same. And the forester will go out and measure the stocking and will, in this particular case, we're assuming that we have a forest that is fully stocked. So that A line that we see here, this dark A line is a fully stocked line and we have a relatively young forest. So we have uh, almost 350 trees per acre and about 105 square feet of basal area. So think about basal area as wood area. It's the surface area. If you went out and measured trees at four and a half feet above ground, the area of wood, if that was a stump, is the surface of it. So a 14 inch tree, to give this a perspective, a 14, 14 inch tree has about one square foot of wood. So if we have 350 trees and 100 square feet, we have a lot of relatively small diameter trees. In fact, we can estimate the diameter here between seven and eight inches in diameter. So this is a relatively young stand. And if we're trying to optimize for timber, we want to uh, make a cut. So we'll make that cut. We'll reduce the number of trees from 350 down to about 200. And the basal area will be reduced by about a third. Remember our rule of thumb, 105 to 75 and 65. So about a third of the basal area in the B line optimizes growth for timber production. And we allow that forest to regrow. So the number of trees doesn't increase, but the size of trees increases from eight inches to 10 inches. And we're back up to the, almost to the A line. And then we cut it again and then let it regrow. And this is an iterative process of cutting and regrowth. This is for timber. Um, and this, these are well worked out relationships. And so I've, I've gone out on a limb here and humor me, if you will, and correct me if you think otherwise, by all means, uh, to, to illustrate a, a hypothetical silvopasture manipulation. And these, uh, these specific numbers that you see are fabricated. So I just kind of pulled these out of my ear. And so don't take them to heart, but try, rather see the, see the principle. Okay, so in this previous situation, we had uh, the, the end result was that we were maintaining a fairly stable level or even increasing basal area. So we started with the basal area of about 100. And over time, we ended up with a basal area of about 120 square feet. That's because we're concentrating, the, the purpose here is to concentrate growth on timber trees. Uh, rather, we need to think about in silvopasture, we're, we're trying to grow biomass. And we're growing biomass at multiple levels in the forest. One level is a ground layer, and that's the forage, and the forage is being eaten by livestock. And we're also growing biomass in trees. So the end result should look different. So we start, again, we have this young stand, fully stocked, and we make a cut. We're going to make a cut of about a, a third of reduction of, of uh, one third in the basal area. We allow it to regrow, but not allow it to regrow all the way to the A line. Uh, we'll allow it to regrow some, and then we cut it again, making about a reduction of one third. And you see now we're down into the area that from a timber perspective, the timber perspective says that this is understocked, uh, but that's not considering that we have biomass, vegetative biomass at two locations, in the canopy as well as on the ground. So here we're allocating sunlight to the ground as well as to the trees. We allow the forest to regrow, but again, we're not allowing it to regrow to its full timber potential. We're maintaining less basal area through time. So before we had an increase in basal area over time, now we're having a decrease in basal area over time. So again, don't get hung up on these numbers. Um, for people that are familiar with stocking charts, if, if there's another way for me to think about this, please let me know uh, and share that with the group. Uh, but, but the stocking chart is a tool that a forester can use uh, advantageously um, knowing, though, that a silvopasture is going to be understocked in comparison to a timber stand. 
So there are going to be some trade-offs in thinning. Um, it's going to probably cost you something certainly early on. Uh, there will be some pre-commercial costs perhaps. It'll take, if you're going to do it, it's going to take some time on your part, and there may be some damage to trees. So this is where it's important to work with a good forester and good loggers. Uh, your forester is going to be aware of things that you need to worry about, such as thinning shock, where you have trees that have been thinned. This was an area, actually, a regeneration cut. We did a thinning and uh, left behind mature trees, 100 years old, but it turns out they were on they were sugar maple on a slightly thin soil and had the misfortune of three sequential um, stressor events. So there can be some thinning shock, there can be some dieback. You can, I showed earlier problems with interfering plants. There's, there are things that can go wrong. So don't just assume I'm going to cut my trees and forage will develop and all will be good in the world. So plan ahead, um, uh, anticipate some um, things that that uh, you need to manage for. So some key considerations before you cut. Uh, carefully select your logger and forester, and we're going to get to that next. Uh, have a written management plan, and writing it down is a nice way to uh, to, to be able to uh, formalize what you're thinking. Learn as much as you can about your forest. Um, be careful. Some people that you work with may offer you opportunities that are uh, that sound tempting, but it's really a high grade in disguise. And then go out and look at some other people that have done some thinning and think about how that, those kinds of operations, uh, those harvesting operations would, would play out in your particular woods. And then when you find that forester, there are several questions you need to ask. Things about uh, future minimum cuts, so planning ahead, uh, the species that are best suited, and then who the local contractors are and what equipment they have available. Thinking back to the example we showed from uh, from Jeff and Ross, having uh, access to uh, loggers that had uh, mechanized equipment was was uh, essential for success of that sale. Okay, so working with foresters, just a couple of thoughts here. First, know that most foresters um, have been trained in schools where it was uh, it was just a, just shy of a law, if not stated as a law, that you never put livestock in the woods. And this was based on very good guidance, historically at least, from former practices that were not silver pasture, where form farmers would put uh, barbed wire fencing around 20 acres or around 40 acres and just turn livestock loose in the woods. And so this this kind of continuous grazing or set-stop grazing process uh, was not beneficial to the livestock and was certainly not beneficial to the woods. Current technologies, and we're not going to go into them here, you can look at other webinars, uh, make it very possible to work with livestock in the woods. But most foresters are not familiar with that. Most forestry colleges, are the, certainly not in the Northeast, are not familiar with strategies for, uh, for, for sustainably managing livestock in the woods. This is a picture from a workshop that Brett and I did in New Hampshire where we're uh, talking with foresters and grazers and agency people about how you can uh, feasibly put livestock into the forest and do it sustainably. Uh, the places where you might find a forester is to talk to other producers, other livestock producers, go to the state forestry agency, um, every state is going to have a, a forest landowner association, and so if you join the forest landowner association, um, many of the other members, you can go to woods walks and conferences and talk to other forest owners. Uh, the Society of American Foresters maintains a website, and there are other professional societies, and then there are trade shows and conferences. So explore all of these uh, as a way to start uh, tracking down, and you want to start by, here's a a list of potential names of foresters. And then once you have that potential, that list of potential foresters, you want to select them based on criteria such as their willingness to work on silver pasture. I can promise you that if you, you can talk to some foresters and say, I want to put livestock in the woods, and they won't want to have anything to do with the project. So uh, they need obviously need to have a willingness and then also a competency to work with silver pasture. Check their references. Uh, talk to other forest owners, make sure that uh, you learn as much as you can about them. Uh, you're going to necessarily 
need to be harvesting low-value trees, low-grade trees, and so they're going to need to be familiar with markets for that. And then just on a personal level, you need to have somebody that you can connect with. Okay, so as we wrap this up, we come full circle, and we're back to uh, step number one is thinking about what you need and what you object, what your objectives are, the, or the objectives of the landowner. Evaluate potential sites, prioritize those locations. Consider the different uh, forest conditions. Um, we talked about stand structure and composition. Stand structure is all important in determining how that sunlight is distributed. But think also about the future conditions. So what if you're going to have a harvest in 10 years, do you have enough to harvest in 10 years and still keep a tree cover? Or is your next harvest going to be a regeneration harvest and you're going to need to be planting trees and finding some way to protect them from the livestock that you use? You'll need to develop a harvesting plan and then you'll need to have some kind of a plan to um, establish forages. Okay, so kind of the key points then, plan for a small train wreck, seek and use good counsel, which is different than seeking and using bad counsel. Um, you should have a plan. I suspect you already have a plan. Write that down. And then always keep in mind what you're managing is the amount and the location of sunlight. So I'll encourage you to become familiar with the uh, Silvopasture Ning site. I think of my arrow for work there. The Silvopasture.ning.com. This is a, a social media site, and it's a place where people who are interested in silvopasturing hang out. It's free to join. You do have to join if you want to post. Anybody can go and read about it. I'll also call your attention if you're anywhere in the Northeast. Well, if you're anywhere at all, you're certainly welcome. Uh, July 8th, uh, this year, 2014, in the Northeastern Adirondacks, Essex County, Brett Chedzoy and I and Joe, For Joe Orofice are going to be working with the Essex County Soil and Water Conservation District and Cooperative Extension and uh, some uh, sponsoring agencies for a uh, silviculture day course. So if you want more information about that, and we'll be posting the agenda and details on the calendar at the silvopasture.ning.com site. So with that, let me humor me just a second. I want to get the link to the exit survey. I know all of you are dying to take that exit survey. So there, click on that hot link I just posted. And at this point, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. I saw that Brett Chedzoy sent me a note earlier, and Brett, if you have your headset, I'm happy to turn it on, and you can certainly help me field any questions. Do we have Brett? Brett's still there. Brett, if you have your headset, send me a, a note. Well, I'm just going to turn your headset on. There we go. Brett's headset is on, and he can talk. So Adam says, Winter feeding, why would the wood be a good place for that? So one of the, and, and Brett has a lot more experience, and I think others probably have more experience than I do, but um, I know that, I know that, um, so the, the, the civil pasture areas will help conserve heat when you have winter storms, um, uh, minimize the amount of drifting of snow, and so you may have conifer plantations in particular that are useful for that. Obviously, there's not going to be any forages. I know that, that Brett has a, a grass-fed operation, and so he'll bring in hay. Is that correct, Brett? Can you hear me? Barely. Barely. Hmm. So maybe you can work on your, on your audio volume. So Dennis says, on a non-commercial cut, would you consider managing slash by making large brush piles on the exterior edge of the pasture to create a forest structure for different wildlife species? You certainly could do that. And I think it all depends on what you have for equipment. So in my woods, and I'm trying to develop, it's about a four or five acre area. We do sustainable livestock production, so we don't sell anything really. We just grow our own meat. And all I have is a chainsaw and an ATV. So I don't tend to move stuff very far. So I have lots of, of little piles 
Uh, but if you had a tractor, if you had, you know, could rent a skid steer with one of the kind of the gripper units on the front, you could certainly um, move around any amount of debris that you would want. Um, there's also skid steers have kind of the fecon brush cutting head that grinds things up. Uh, that's another way that you could manage debris. I didn't, I didn't think about that earlier in response to Adam's question. So Elizabeth, I know this is going to be dependent on forages, but compared with regular pasture, how much more land might I need to sustain the same amount of animals on silver pasture? Outstanding question. Hopefully Brett turns his gets his microphone figured out. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I can hear you about the same, so if you say it, then I'll repeat it in case other people can't hear. Okay. Or I can turn my sound up. Maybe that's the problem. Huh. Oh, I can hear you. I can hear you better now when I turn my volume up. <laughs> I don't want to mess my computer and that's just absolutely necessary. The stocking capacity of the solar pasture area is going to depend completely on the I mean, it's going to depend from one silvo pasture to the next, and one acre to the next, and what stage of development it's in. And if you look at the images throughout this presentation, in a newly developing silvo pasture area, there might be very little forage that's available to feed animals. But if you look at some of the other images in a more mature silvo pasture, and by mature I mean one where the, the forage establishment process has been underway for years and it's being managed in a way to promote forage growth, then your your carrying capacity or your total forage production on an annual basis could be strong in a good in a civil pasture area as it could be in an open pasture. There's, there's always going to be some trade offs. Uh, for example, and obviously it's much of this presentation is focused on you're going to lose some sunlight or some solar energy to grow forage because it's being accepted by the tree. Uh, on the flip side, the trees are providing a cooler microclimate for grazing animals. They're using less energy to dissipate heat. They're going to be grazing longer. Uh, the, the cool season grasses will grow a little bit longer into the late spring season. They might start growing a little bit earlier in the early fall season. And um, I don't remember if Pete pointed it out or not, but there's there's been research done that uh, Charlie Feldhake from the Ag Research Service down in West Virginia before that lab was closed a few years ago was looking at the uh, growth of different cool season forages under partial canopy and uh, came to the realization that cool season grasses, some cool season grasses, utilize the few sunlight better than full sunlight, uh, which can be part of the explanation of why cool season grasses generally go dormant during, during the peak summer months. So, you can't say that a civil pasture will support X percent of whatever open pasture will support. Um, it, it just totally depends on the quality and the quantity of the forage. And the under -storage. So, Brett, Brett, if you had an, an ideal civil pasture, um, just to give it kind of a ballpark, is that 25%, 50%, 75%, 100% of a, of a full sunlight pasture? So I, I, a a well-developed, well-managed solar pasture could support at least as much livestock as an open pasture. So 100, basically 100%. 100%. Yeah, okay, good. Getting the timber resource for free. Not, not really, but you're, you're, you're not done properly, you shouldn't really diminish the grazing resource, and you're managing the timber resource on top of it. Okay. Okay. So Aileen said she couldn't hear. 
So the 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 gist of what Brett offered was that uh, it's going to very much depend upon the characteristics of the forages in the silvo pasture. Uh, this is in the que in response to the question of um, uh, from Elizabeth about uh, how much more land was needed to sustain the same amount of animal from silvopasture. So it depends upon the maturity of the silvopasture. Newly developed silvopasture is going to be less capable, but a well-developed um, uh, kind of an ideal silvopasture is going to be um, uh, comparable to a full sunlight um, pasture, so or very or very close to it. Did that capture it pretty well, Brett? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, so I'll um, just reiterate again. Let me post the uh, exit survey. And I want to encourage everyone certainly to do that. And also, if you're interested in silvo pasture, please join the Ning site. And if you're actively practicing silvo pasture, then please uh, share your experiences with that network of people. There are people all across the country that are part of that silvo pasture Ning site, and that'll be um, useful for us. All right, so Brett's typing. I just muted him. Okay, well, I think that we will call this to a close. I want to thank you all for participating, and um, please join us next month. We're going to be talking about the Asian longhorn beetle in rural woodlands, so the Asian longhorn beetle moving from urban areas to rural woodlands. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon.